Usually when a film ends up being disappointing, the director gets the bulk of the blame. However, a lot of scorn also seems to go towards the screenwriter. But is that really fair? Whenever a new project is announced, people like to head to a writer's IMDb page to look at their credentials and decide simply on that whether somebody is a good screenwriter or not. But writers will be the first to tell you that their list of credits does not always paint an accurate portrait of their work, especially in films where the director, the producers, and the studio executives wield more power over the final product than the writer does. People will typically wonder out loud why a writer with dubious credits continues to get hired on multiple projects. And to understand why, it's best to look at how they get started. What will ultimately lead a screenwriter to a job on a Hollywood production is they'll write something called a spec script. The primary goal of this isn't really to get it produced, but more as a showcase for their writing abilities. If they can get an interested agent, the spec script will then be sent out to various producers and studios to show off their client. For instance, Joss Whedon began his film career with his spec script, a satirical horror film called Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which was passed around within Hollywood circles and was widely loved. This was eventually turned into a feature film, albeit one where the finished product was very different from Whedon's draft, as the director envisioned it more as a teen comedy, and Donald Sutherland rewrote many of his lines, which was odd since it was an expositionary role. Even though Buffy was a critical and box office disappointment, the original script was beloved enough to get him jobs writing on such films as Alien Resurrection, Waterworld, Speed, and Twister. The team behind Toy Story were particularly huge fans of Buffy, which led him to co-writing that animated classic. And it was the original script for Buffy that led to the successful television series, not the finished film, which is why the pilot episode references events that were only in Whedon's initial draft. This is how Guardians of the Galaxy came to be, as Nicole Perlman's spec scripts impressed Marvel head Kevin Feige to ask her to suggest one of their comic book properties for a potential movie, and she picked Guardians. It's been a matter of dispute which of her material is in the finished film, but without the high quality of her spec scripts, the project would not have happened at all. Her Captain Marvel co-writer, Meg LaFell, similarly got hired to work on the scripts for Pixar's Inside Out and The Good Dinosaur because of her unproduced spec scripts. So for a lot of writers, when they get hired for a project, it's more because of their sample work and unmade scripts rather than the finished product we see on screen. When a writer is hired onto a project, they are not the only person involved in developing the script. Obviously, the director will have their say, as will the producer and executives, and once the film hits the screen, many people will have put their fingerprints on it. This is particularly true of the big temples, especially the superhero films that fill the multiplexes every year. Ant-Man, for instance, had an infamous development, where Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish were involved in early drafts, then left the project and were replaced by Paul Rudd, Adam McKay, and director Peyton Reed. For some viewers, it became a guessing game of trying to figure out which elements came from the right Cornish drafts and which ones came later, and some of the results are actually quite surprising. Based on his work on Shaun of the Dead and Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, a lot of folks, myself included, assume the scenes of Lewis's flashbacks were obviously from Wright. Nope. This was actually a suggestion of Reed's, as was the decision to expand Hope Van Dyne's role in the story. And of course, Kevin Feige is infamous for making sure the films fit into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which explain why Marvel films have a number of storytelling similarities, even with a variety of directors and writers on board. Probably the most infamous case of the influence of many writers on a superhero project is the first Spider-Man movie. That film was in development for over two decades, with many different writers and directors throwing ideas into the ring. And when Columbia Pictures acquired the rights in the late 90s, they also bought those earlier scripts. And even though David Cope was the sole credited writer, a lot of that material ended up in the finished film, including the organic web shooters concept. Even after Cope was hired, other writers like Scott Rosenberg and Alvin Sargent were also brought in at various points in pre-production and filming to work on the script, and of course, Sam Raimi provided a lot of input too, as did Avi Arad and other folks associated with the project. Needless to say, that made Spider-Man quite a nightmare for all involved, when the Writers Guild got together to decide on writing credits in an arbitration case. What's an arbitration case? 
Well, when a film is completed, an anonymous panel of judges in the Writers Guild of America will review all the different drafts and declare who will receive credit. Multiple parties will usually chime in to argue their case, including directors, producers, and writers who at one point attached to the project. More often than not, most people leave the arbitration cases not pleased with the final verdict. And it doesn't just happen on big Hollywood productions. Independent films also go through this. There was an infamous case a couple of years ago with 12 Years a Slave, where the film's director Steve McQueen won its screenplay credit. But in the end, the dub J gave John Ridley sole credit, which he did not take kindly towards, and that's why Ridley did not thank McQueen in his Oscar Septon speech and vice versa. A lot of dub J decisions have proven controversial, with some of their final verdicts being quite strange. Graham Yost was the sole credited screenwriter on the critically acclaimed blockbuster Speed, but according to him, Joss Whedon wrote most of the dialogue and contributed a lot to the script, and that the WGA decided only Yost deserved credit for the script. Their preference for first writers also leads to some unusual decisions. When the film rights of the book The Postman were bought in the early 90s, Eric Roth wrote the initial draft. When Kevin Costner came on board to direct many years later, Roth had already long departed from the project, and none of his material was used, and yet he still got a co-writing credit, much to Roth's confusion. There are also script doctors who will come in to punch up a script, but not receive credit. Writers like Joss Whedon, Tom Mankiewicz, M. Night Shyamalan, and even Carrie Fisher made healthy livings as script doctors. If a writer is unavailable during production, or there's a writer's strike, production will seek out other people to work on the script without their knowledge. This happened with Sam Hamm, one of the credited writers on Tim Burton's Batman movie, as controversial decisions like having the Joker be the Wayne's killer was made when there was a writer's strike going on and he was unavailable. Producers and studio executives will also enforce certain requirements the writers will have to comply with. When John Peters was in charge of a Superman movie in the 90s, he was insistent that Superman fight a giant spider at some point. Enough that this became a major in-joke at Warner Brothers at the time. He also held the rights Neil Gaiman's The Sandman and continually told screenwriters Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio to include a giant spider, despite their protests that it was not an appropriate fit for the story. I have a theory that Barry Sonfeld only included a giant spider in Wild Wild West just so Peters would stop pestering future writers about it. You might think, well, why doesn't the writer just retaliate and not include these preposterous ideas in the script? Well, they could, but they then run the risk of losing the job. When Fox was trying to get a new Planet of the Apes movie off the ground in the 90s, one executive was headset on there being a scene where the apes learn how to play baseball. One writer thought that was a stupid idea and chose not to include it in the script, and then was promptly fired. Had this executive not later left Fox, there absolutely would have been such a scene in the Tim Burton adaptation. That's not even getting into the choices made by the director that end up in the finished film, independent of the shooting script, and what happens in the editing room that could affect the story structure and character development. Even actors will make decisions that affect the writing, whether it's through their performance or certain suggestions they make for their characters. The thing with film is it's a collaborative medium, and while the director is normally king, there are other people adding insight into the production. Which brings me to my concluding thoughts. People tend to ask me why I continually give filmmakers multiple chances to impress me, and why I don't like holding their past work against them when they become attached to a new project. The reason is, I don't believe in there being bad directors or bad writers. I genuinely believe everyone is talented, and eventually some spark will ignite, and all of them will collaborate to produce something good and worthwhile. With every upcoming project, even if the director was responsible for a film I disliked, or it's a sequel to a film I wasn't particularly fond of, I think this is the one. Because I want them to succeed. Filmmakers are hard-working individuals who just want to make a good film, and I root for them to impress me. Few things please me more than to see a filmmaker finally win me over. I find it interesting when a filmmaker with a dubious track record gets hired onto a project, and people instantly groan and want he or she fired. The only positions people on the outside continually root for somebody to be fired are politicians and filmmakers. The former is understandable, since they can affect the economy or get harmful laws passed, but the worst crime a director can do is make a disappointing product. 
You don't stand outside of an office building rooting for Jim and financing to get a pink slip. If you think they're not the right fit for a project, why not suggest alternate projects they can work on? Like, hey, I don't want to see Michael Bay make yet another Transformers movie, but I'm curious to see him tackle another biographical film. Or, I'm not fond of the direction Zack Snyder is taking these DC Comics properties, but I see he's interested in adapting The Fountainhead. That seems like an appropriate fit, and he could take the material in an interesting direction. And, believe it or not, Hollywood does reach a point where they deem a filmmaker unhirable. Shane Black may be having a career resurrection right now with Iron Man 3 and The Nice Guys, but there was a period after the Long Kiss Goodnight flopped when he couldn't even get a meeting at any of the major studios. Joe Estrus has also had trouble getting projects off the ground, and he was one of the highest paid screenwriters of the 90s. And that's sad. Whenever a writer is hired for a project, I congratulate them on the gig, wish them good luck, and look forward to what they and the director put together. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.